my goal today is really to help you introduce you to the approach that Grok took to accelerate uh, HPC and ML workloads uh, using our, our chip. Essentially, and you know, it's only a 30 minute talk, so there's gonna be a lot of details that I'll be going through really quickly. I do encourage a lot of folks in the room to take a look at our ISCA publication. So we have one in 2022, uh, one in 2020. And it really goes into a lot of the details of what we actually delivered in terms of an architecture. Um, you know, one of the things that Grok does believe is this is a trend that will continue. Uh, and you know, we welcome the community to actually build on a lot of the innovations that Grok has developed. So a little bit of background, a lot of folks in the room probably haven't heard of the company. Uh, we are a uh, machine learning and HPC chip startup. So we essentially have developed a tensor string processor, uh, you know, focused on accelerating a lot of these, you know, highly dense uh, uh, compute workloads. Uh, started roughly in 2016 by a bunch of, you know, Googlers. Um, the founding team actually built the first TPU that was deployed at Google, Tensor Processing Unit. Uh, Jonathan Ross is our founder and CEO. Uh, the company is roughly 250 people right now, uh, spread across uh, North America and the UK. Uh, and we are definitely hiring, a little bit of shameless marketing here. Uh, you, you don't need a machine learning background. Uh, actually, some of our best engineers didn't really uh, uh, do machine learning in their PhDs or prior lives. Uh, we're really just looking for smart, talented engineers uh, who really think from a first principles perspective and are able to innovate uh, and have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. So, you know, if you take a look at what Grok actually built and how we came to this, this point, um, it really started with a pretty simple question. So given the data flow nature of machine learning workloads and HPC today, what would you actually build? Um, and there's some salient characteristics of these type of workloads, right? They generally are represented as a computational graph. Each node in that graph is some operator or you know, core compute that's gonna do some function. And edges within that graph represent input operands and results. And basically, each of those operands will trigger once its inputs are available. So pretty simple model. And the idea here is, you know, instead of taking the traditional approach of multi-core CPU or GPGPU and incrementally innovating on top of that, which is what you see a lot of the incumbents do, they basically take their existing architecture, tweak it a bit to, you know, add a bit more dense compute on top of it. But fundamentally, the architecture has not changed. We took this really top-down approach of, you know, given a blank state, what would you actually build? And that really, led us to re-examine the entire hardware software contract that existed in the industry and just really create something quite different. And ultimately what we did is ended up creating hardware that's much more predictable. And one of the key tenants or key aspects of our design is we actually give a ton of control back to software. So this notion of giving uh, uh, software control over the hardware is, is not really new. Uh, it's an old idea, and quite frankly, it actually has failed in the past, right? So there's, you know, if you take a look at a risk processor, uh, it does hide a lot of the hardware details from the software. You know, it's gonna do instruction level parallelism, reorder all the instructions on its own, um, branch prediction, uh, how it deals with caches, that's all kind of out of software's control, right? But there was this push, I think it was roughly in the 90s, to really move away from that. So this notion of very long instruction words. So the idea behind that is create more complicated hardware abstractions to the software such that it can control things better, right? And Intel actually productized this. It was the Itanium. You know, most folks in the room probably have never even heard of this. It, it was generally not that successful. Um, the compiler actually struggled in this case. And, you know, you couldn't get good performance out of this machine. Um, so then what's different? Like, why, why are we revisiting this notion again? Well, it, you know, it's kind of a confluence of a bunch of factors, and it's almost a perfect storm right now. Um, it is really, as we see it, the end of the CPU hegemony, like CPU dominance. So that's kind of sunsetting these days, and, and for a few key reasons. 
first of all, the workloads are much different, right? The key workloads that really have that insatiable demand for compute, they're fundamentally different than what a CPU was built for. This data flow nature is only growing. You're gonna see more and more workloads uh, fall in the data flow domain as opposed to control flow heavy. Secondly, you know, as our last speaker mentioned, Moore's Law, Denard scaling, all of that is slowing down if not stop. Uh, you know, Intel's a little bit in denial, but it's definitely happening uh, no matter what Intel says. Um, and then there's this, you know, this has led to this golden age of computing. So, you know, Hennessy Patterson, legendary computer architects, uh, they had their Turing lecture basically talking about this is a new golden age for computing. Um, paired with that, Chris Latner, again, legendary compiler architect, uh, you know, paired this talk with his talk, which is, you know, that leads to a new golden age for compilers. And this is definitely true. If you take a look at the level of investment in the space, it's, it's been enormous in the last decade. You can see that this, this conference, the number of hardware vendors there are, and the diversity of ideas uh, is enormous now. And I think it's fantastic for the industry. Uh, this is gonna lead to a lot of interesting ideas and innovation uh, and progress in this space. And I think it's actually quite exciting for this generation of researchers to use this new technology and innovate on kind of the seeds of ideas that we planted as a community. So yeah, I mean, this really opens this uh, uh, notion that we can take a look at the hardware software uh, abstraction contract and reopen it. And that's really what Grok has done. So if you take a look at what we've devised, so you take a look at our Grok chip, it's relatively simple. So because we've relinquished control of the hardware back to software, the hardware itself is extremely simple. And you, you know, just from an intuitive sense, if you take a look at our die footprint compared to NVIDIA, it's drastically simpler. You know, the, the hardware is actually very, very, very simple. Uh, and by doing that, you essentially gain levels of efficiencies that you cannot do from a CPU or GPU. So all those transistors in there that used to be dedicated to just control the machine or control the chip, they are now free to be used to actually do the core workload. So statistics here, like if you take a look at a typical CPU, the vast majority of its uh, area or silicon has nothing to do with the actual compute. It, it's really just you know, moving data, controlling the chip, things that are peripheral to what you're actually trying to achieve in your workload. And we kind of throw all of that complexity out such that at the end of the day, most of the transistors or the die area is really just focused on solving your problem uh, in HPC and machine learning. So if you take a look at the chip, you know, here's a high level diagram of what's actually on it and there's really not that much in terms of complexity on it and there's only a handful of components. So, you know, at the ends of the chip are kind of our heavy hammers. They're effectively these big matrix units. So you have your highly dense uh, multiply accumulates done in these matrix units, almost a petaop of performance. Coupled with that is our on-die memory. So just like the last speaker said, it doesn't really matter how many flops you can get out of the chip. If you can't feed it, it doesn't matter. It's just gonna starve. So one of the things that we've done is ensured that we had low latency, high bandwidth connectivity to those matrix units such that we can always feed them every single cycle with useful data. And that's what you can see here, you know, over 80 terabytes of internal memory bandwidth, which is enormous. You definitely don't see that on a CPU or a GPU. Additionally, we have these direct I.O. links. So this is another unique feature about our chip. So you can actually send data from the outside world directly into our chip and it gets sucked in into the memory units and then fed into the matrix units. Um, and you can actually build our chips like Lego. So you can actually expand the memory capacity or compute capacity of a single chip by just stitching these chips together uh, one by one. And that's how we actually build out uh, our rack, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. <clears throat> so another key um, tenet of how we design this chip is really this notion of determinism. So it's something that you know, is kind of glossed over, um, 
but it's, like, it's, it's, it's this kind of thorn in a lot of people's side where as a developer, you really want your underlying hardware to be deterministic. In other words, it's very frustrating to, to use. And that is not a promise that most of the vendors can keep. So given a set of inputs, your output should be exactly the same. And if it's not, like, how do you debug this thing, right? Oftentimes you're building new algorithms that have never been done before. Is the bug, is it the bug in your algorithm, your code? Or is something else happening? You have no idea. So it's quite frustrating if you cannot keep that deterministic prom promise as an application developer. Secondly, to develop hardware or co software on top of this, having deterministic hardware actually makes things enormously simple. If you can expose 100% of the architectural state of the hardware to your compiler, the compilation problem becomes enormously simple. If you can guarantee things like latency, where exactly buffers are stored at any given time, the compiler has 100% visibility of what to do and can actually schedule things in a very efficient manner. So this is the one thing that I think Intel missed when it did the Itanium. It kind of went halfway. It gave some control back to software, but then it still hid a lot of things like memory hierarchy, latencies were not fixed, in certain instructions, and that's where they kind of started shooting themselves in the, in the foot and why it was very difficult to actually make a compiler for the Itanium that, that actually worked well. Additionally, if you look at how we actually develop the architecture, it lends itself to this producer-consumer stream model, which is much more analogous to the data flow workloads that I talked about in the previous slide. So if you take a look at the chip, which I'll talk about, data kind of streams across the chip in this one-dimensional fashion as, and it hits the compute units, a little bit like an assembly line. So at all costs, what we want to do is avoid chip complexity, right? So things like speculative execution, things like complicated memory hierarchies, we throw that all out. None of that exists in our design. Um, Every single functional unit within the design has a fixed latency, so you know exactly when to schedule an instruction and where and when it'll actually be executed in. Like every single detail is taken care of to the exact cycle. Um, and the compiler actually explicitly allocates the tensors within the memory space. Again, something that's not really true for a lot of CPU compilers. You're kind of just allocating memory at a high level and then expecting things to kind of fall in the right place over time. <clears throat> so to understand the architecture a bit further, uh, you know, I think one of the easier ways is to draw the analogy to something that a lot of folks are more familiar with, that is the you know, multi-core CPU. And if you take a look at what a multi-core CPU does, is it'll have a highly optimal, optimized core. Uh, that core usually can do you know, general functionality. It's gonna have a ALU, it'll have a instruction decode unit. Um, it'll be optimized extremely well, but it's generalized. So you're at any point in the, in the space, you're actually replicating this core across the chip, and at any point you can do a vast array of different things. And this is great for a lot of applications. You know, you can run Linux on these things, right? So that's, that's something that's fantastic and it's good for everybody. But it's not well tuned for a lot of the workloads of tomorrow. So contrast to what Grok is doing, we're taking basically the dual approach to this. So instead of having generality at every single point in space, we're specializing at different points in space. So essentially we're chopping up the chip into vertical slices. Within each slice, we are specializing that silicon to do one thing and one thing only. So what's the benefit of doing that? Well, a lot, again, a lot of that control logic that you needed to control your machine is no longer necessary. So for example, at the ends of the chip, I have my matrix units. If that's all it's doing, you don't need a complicated instruction fetch unit or instruction decode because every single cycle, it's just doing one thing and one thing only. 
And similarly, that's how we're laying out all our other functional units. Another key thing is now data moves to the functional units as opposed to being fetched by the functional unit. This kind of flips the problem on its head again, where the functional unit itself is rather dumb. So we take a look at a CPU. It's going to try to move that data 10 times before it actually starts to do anything with it. Whereas in our architecture, we're basically letting the data come to you. Again, this data flow model, keep that in mind, that's basically what's happening within the silicon. So we essentially perfectly mapped our silicon to service this data flow-like nature of these machine learning and HPC workloads of today. Um, so yeah, data is really just going to flow in a one-dimensional uh, manner across the chip. So zooming into specific units on the chip, uh, so the matrix engines, we abbreviate them as MXMs or matri matrix multiply engines. So there's two of them on each side of the chip. Within each MXM, there's two planes, and each plane is responsible for doing a singular matrix, vector matrix operation every single cycle. So specifically, it will perform a one uh, by 32 times three, uh, sorry, one by 320 times 320 by 320 uh, vector matrix operation. So how we get that one petal off, basically we're performing this vector matrix operation every single cycle times it by four. So if you have a gigahertz clock, you know, you're doing a lot of compu compute every single cycle. Um, and then we support both int8 and FP16. We do support FP32 by sort of emulating it. It's not native in the hardware, but you can do multiple passes, for example, to get that FP32 uh, precision if you want it. So central unit is our, our VXM or vector execution model. Really just think of this as a very wide SIMD engine just sitting in the middle of the chip. Um, so you know why you need this, th this kind of handles a lot of the esoteric or nonlinear functions that are common in machine learning and deep and HPC workloads. Uh, and so basically, effectively what's in this VXM is not just one big wide arithmetic unit, it's actually 16, and you can chain these arithmetic units together. Um, so eight of them, we refer to them as small ALUs or arithmetic units, and eight of them are big. Really, the small ones are just a subset of functionality of the big ones to save a little bit of silicon area uh, because you don't need to chain you know, all the operations back to back in a lot of cases. For example, the, the big ALUs will do casting operations that are not available in the small ALUs because when you cast data types, you usually just cast it once. You, you don't want to continue to cast it down to 10 different types. Then our switch execution module, so it's basically a switching unit. Um, just think of this as a big crossbar, so it allows you to do interesting data reshapes on your vectors that go into it, which are, again, common in HPC and deep learning workloads. So streaming registers, so this is a core tenant to how data moves across the chip in this sort of horizontal fashion. So again, you think of everything as a tensor assembly line where data is coming to functional units. So as the data hits a functional unit, it will in place operate on that data and then spit out a result uh, you know, down its lane. Uh, on the chip, there's 32 streams, uh, 32 uh, going left, 32 going right. Um, each stream itself contains a vector of 320 bytes. So if you start doing the math, multiplying it, and again, multiplying it by one gigahertz, that's an enormous amount of data that's actually flowing across the chip. Um, so this gives you a sense of how data is actually, you know, moves within the chip. So let's say this is a cartoon view of the chip, a little bit hard to see, but you have your MXMs on the outside of the chip, your SXM, and then you have these memory slices or memory banks that are kind of speckled in between. So let's say I want to read out <coughs> four vectors, what you would do to each bank. It's just send an address, read it onto a sh associated stream, and then send it either left or right onto that stream, and then away it goes. And that's it. What's required by the compiler in tandem to that is to schedule at the exact right time 
for the functional unit to process that data as it passes by it. Because if you don't, that, that data will literally just fall off the chip. There's nothing stopping it. Again, because there's no control, once you schedule that piece of data to start flowing on the stream, it'll just keep on going indefinitely until it falls off the chip. And then to generate larger data types, so within each stream, you only can hold uh, byte-wise elements, so 320 bytes of data. What we do is just interleave streams together. So if I want a bigger data type, like an FP32, I'll just read out four streams and then interleave their data to form those bigger data types. And then, you know, if you take a look at each functional unit, there's actually a relatively simple ISA or set of instructions that can control it. Um, I think the one key thing that's unique about this architecture is that each instruction not only tells you when to schedule things, but it has this notion of space and, and time exactly. So this notion of moving left or right is actually exposed within the ISA to tell the hardware, you know, where the data is coming from and where to put its results. Yeah, so this is just an illustration of a program actually running on the chip. I think this is running either one of the BERT level transformers or something like that. It just highlights the amount of data that's flowing. So, uh, you know, here we've essentially decoupled the movement of the data moving left and the data moving right, but in reality, the hardware, you know, obviously it's one chip, so it's not physically laid out like this, but this just makes it a bit more clear in terms of what's going on from a visual perspective. Uh, and the main interesting thing, it really does highlight the amount of activity that's actually happening. And this is where a lot of the efficiency comes from. Because you're able to have every single functional unit active at, for every single cycle, that's where you get an enormous amount of uh, uh, efficiencies. There's very little idle time that actually occurs when you're uh, running a program on this chip. So in terms of compilation, we, this is where a lot of the divergence happens with our approach to traditional HPC processors. So here's your standardized you know, NVIDIA flow where how it compiles um, you know, a lot of these HPC workloads to its device. And I think the dirty little, like it's a bit of an open secret. It's not that, 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 that secretive, but they effect, effectively don't really have a compiler. Their compiler is thousands of engineers writing assembly. And I think uh, Intel has the same thing. They have their MKL, MKL DNN library. Again, very smart mathematicians writing assembly. You see this in the finance space. Again, highly paid uh, mathematicians writing assembly. Like they, the compiler does nothing in a lot of these cases. They're just stitching up these library calls. And it, it's not really a knock. It's, 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 it's actually quite effective. If you have a thousand engineers, you might as well do that. Uh, and if it does a better job than the compiler, you should do it. And it comes down to the fact that it's actually very hard to parallelize on these architectures because they have so many reactive components on the device. So because the hardware is so complicated, it's almost impossible to get do these things in an automated fashion. A human will always beat the compiler, you know, nine times out of ten. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that we've done, again, because we don't have those reactive components, we've essentially dumbed down the hardware such that everything is happening in a fixed lat latency increments. We can create an automated vectorizing compiler, and the benefits of this is enormous. It just simplifies the capital investment that you need to actually build the software stack. Uh, the software team at Grok is relatively small. We're actually one of the smallest startups uh, in this space in terms of headcount because we don't need so many people to actually build this complicated software stack to compile to this chip. Um, and, you know, one of the things that screams about the architecture as well is just you can actually derive a lot of computational efficiency automatically from the chip. So because we have this sort of high bandwidth, low latency connectivity of a memory to our matrix units, you can actually utilize the chip relatively efficiently. So this is basically showing the compilation of different matrix sizes uh, through our compiler and running on the chip, and then we're essentially measuring the utilization of the chip over different matrix sizes, and then comparing to a more traditional architecture 
where you see this you know, drastic underutilization of the chip. And again, this comes back to, I think the talk, last talk also talked about this. If, it doesn't matter what your peak tops are. If you can't feed it, it's, it's useless, essentially. And that's what you're seeing with a lot of these more traditional architectures. It's like you're trying to suck the data out of a tiny straw and feeding it into your ALUs. It, it just doesn't work in a lot of the cases unless you size things perfectly, which is a big pain in the butt for a lot of application developers. Like they don't, they effectively what you end up doing is just mapping or changing your workload to map the hardware. Um, so in terms of products, you know, we're shipping cards today. We've developed an entire scalable system such that we can build out an entire Grok rack. How we actually tackle the scale out problem is we essentially have a software scheduled direct network approach. So you can directly connect nodes within the system. You know, it's a bit complicated in terms of what's happening here, but ultimately what we do is within each node, yeah, um, each TSP can talk to every single TSP. So there's eight cards within a node and through those direct IO connections, we enabled the point where every card can talk to every other card. And then we have eight of these nodes in a rack and then it does the same thing. Each node in that rack can talk to every single other node. And then from that, we can actually build out pretty scalable software um, to do automated partitioning and actually break your model up across these uh, different nodes and TSPs in an automated fashion, um, such that we can have linear scaling depending on, you know, regardless how many racks you have, how big your model is, it'll just automatically scale up and down depending on how much compute is available on your chip. And there's this really nice paper out of Google that they just published. It's on archive. Uh, I think it's called ALPA, A-L-P-A, uh, where they automatically partition large models onto different GPUs. So we take a similar approach in some sense, but our job is somewhat simpler because, again, we have those deterministic chips. Um, one key advantage of what we're doing is Latency is a big advantage in terms of how we're able to uh, get uh, results. So here, I think this is out of our ISCA 2022 paper. Uh, and basically we're comparing BERT, which is a natural language processing workload, and comparing its results against uh, NVIDIA's A100. And we get a several fold reduction in terms of latency with competitive throughput. I think one of the nice things I like about this as well is if you actually take a look at the transistor count, we're using way fewer transistors to get a much better result. So even though we have an older process, like the manufacturing is a little bit older, so each transistor itself is bigger, we still can beat them because we're using those transistors much more effectively. Again, because we don't have to have the complicated uh, reactive components to build into the chip. And then additionally, LSTMs, this is an interesting workload because there's a lot of actual data dependencies within the model. And because we have that low latency, high bandwidth memory just right next to our compute units, we handle those data dependencies quite well. Uh, and that's why we can get, you know, uh, well over order of magnitude uh, better results than uh, state-of-the-art results published by industry. I think Intel actually has the best results for this workload prior to our work. And in terms of workloads, <clears throat> again, this, this story about compiling more and more different type of workloads in an automated fashion, it just continues in our story where we're, you know, basically if you measured the number of different types of workloads that we supported, it's been this exponential growth. Uh, again, because it's automated, we're not hiring thousands of engineers to write things by hand. So yeah. Um, you know, key takeaways, basically we've developed an approach to do uh, uh, software defined uh, hardware. We have a deterministic approach to how we actually build our hardware, leading to a much simpler approach and how we actually can uh, compile to this device. So maybe I, I'm happy to take maybe one or two questions. Yeah. This is probably a two-part question. If you go back to your slide, you have the results. What activation function were you using in the BERT model? Uh, so this is BERT-based. It's a standard one. 
So I don't know if there's any divergence in terms of the activation. Uh, so then, if you go back to you, you have basically a table where you're showing your activation functions. So you, it looks like you only handle like 10 or oh. signals. So you, you, my, I guess my question is, are you using the 10 to approximation and can you handle non-linear activation functions? Yes, yes, so absolutely. Um, so the chip itself is Turing complete. So we will decompose more complicated uh, uh, activation functions into more baseline operators. So we can support a vast array of different activation functions. We just so happen to have some activation functions that are more highly optimized directly in the silicon. Um, so we're not limited in terms of activation functions that we can actually process. Yeah. Maybe one more. Anyone else? Yeah. Many class to make this a training career? Yes. So, I mean, right now we've been focused on inference just because it's a simpler problem. But at the end of the day, they look very similar, you know. So we're doing the forward prop of the training application. And because we can scale out so seamlessly with those direct I.O., uh, training is something that we can tackle. We just haven't focused on it initially um, with our product. 